on the bean bags look way too comfortable. But, uh, congratulations. Um, Peter gave me my background. That's my uh, White House uniform. This is a little bit more of the Silicon Valley outfit here. Uh, I was uh, running Yahoo's incubator and I set up a relationship between Yahoo and NASA. And I've had a lot of trouble at Yahoo because uh, for those of you who work for large corporations, when you do try and do big innovation or disruptive innovation alongside or attached to the big company, the immune system of the company will come and attack you. Right? Uh, and essentially that's the issue that we have with large organizations and how do we handle that. Uh, they're all built to resist change and resist risk. Uh, and as we enter this more disruptive world, I'm going to touch on that as we go a little bit further into the presentation. I'm going to build a little bit more on what Peter said and, and drill into some of the aspects of what he talked about. Um, and then I want to talk about what are the societal implications around this. How do we organize ourselves from a social perspective, from a business perspective, that give you some context for how we think about the next few days of extraordinary innovations that we're going to see. This is the original circuit board back from 1971. We had 200 chips on it. We now have teraflops of computing on that same physical space. Importantly, when we go back to this thing, uh, three years before the integrated chip was invented, physicists at IBM published papers saying it would never be done, that it was impossible to do. And three years later, then they left the business, they left the chip business. And three years later, this happened. Um, the uh, shock and awe stat that I like to use is, uh, if we'd seen the same uh, top, uh, for the, the top speed of a car, if we'd have seen the same 40% increase annually that we've seen in desktop computing, uh, increasing 40% a year, we would have a car today that went faster than the speed of light. Right? So give you some sense of what you have in your pockets. And we're now seeing that pace of change, this shift from this to this, happen in every single one of the technologies that we think about at Singularity, whether it's neuroscience through imaging, medicine, robotics, AI, and so on. Um, we have today about 8 billion, half of, 10 years ago we had half a billion connected devices on the internet. Today we're up to 8 billion. In 10 years we'll be up to 50 billion. And then shortly after that we'll be up to a trillion uh, connected devices. So just think about that one metric, 8 billion today to going to a trillion in a couple of decades. We think we're 30, 40 years into the information revolution. On this metric we're just about 1%. We're just starting. And so we have a, a whole load of uh, changes and disruptions coming. And we're seeing now new business models being created on this information paradigm. Ten years ago, Google was kind of a joke. Nobody knew how they were going to make money. And now they're a $300 billion company by essentially manipulating text and now video. Right? Facebook, a $100 billion company by essentially digitizing our relationships. Groupon, Foursquare attacking the yellow page in the industry. Right? Thank God somebody's doing that. Uh, and as we get into all the billions and trillions of sensors out there, we'll see entirely new models emerge that we don't see anymore. Peter talked about how we're digitizing the world. Note that all of our communications are now digital, not analog, right? Our relationships are now digital, not analog. Our memories aren't in our heads anymore, they're in our smartphones. Right? You put your cell phone aside, you're kind of half a person within about eight seconds. Uh, and so this is essentially how, if you're below 30 years old, the appearance of your Facebook profile is more important than how you're dressed that day. Right? And you can tell by how some of these kids are dressing today that that's the case. Um, so Peter, uh, you know, we're, uh, Daniel and Peter both mentioned Singularity University. Uh, this curve, our mission statement is essentially educate a new generation of leadership. We're entering this world where information is driving exponential growth and all of our constructs are linear. All of our leadership, business or political, especially political, operate on that linear basis. The Arab Spring is an example of that. The younger generation is leveraging information and manipulating it in a way that the older generation can't even conceive of, and that's causing all that stress. Uh, from a business perspective, where you have that gap of disruption and stress, you also have opportunity, and so how can you harvest that pace of change? These are the disciplines and technologies we cover. Um, the ones on the top left there, we focus on the aspects of those that are doubling about every one to two years in their price performance. We look a lot at the bottom ones. How do you spot an exponential trend? What are the legal, ethical implications around all this? Uh, how do you use design as an aesthetic to bind all these disciplines together? How do you fund a new idea and so on? We, the, one of the things that we are very worried about is that these technologies running on that curve are moving at this pace no matter what. If uh, George Bush, for ideological reasons, uh, you know, sent all these uh, stop stem cell research, all the researchers uh, left, China, Canada, wherever, stem cell researchers continued at pace. 
And so there's no stopping that curve, and I think that's an important part of that exponential curve that Peter mentioned. Ray's biggest observation was that once something hops on that information basis and starts doubling, it stays on that path. Nothing shakes it off that path. So for 100 years, through wars, recessions, ups and downs in the semiconductor industry, we've seen this pattern double away. Um, so we've gathered together many of the leading thinkers across all of these areas. We'll be hearing from some of these folks uh, today. We do a whole series of uh, programs. The heart of our program is a 10-week graduate studies program that we do at NASA every summer. For the summer, 80 students from 40, 35, or 40 different countries come and live with us. Average age is about 30. They've all shown academic excellence in their background. They've ha shown leadership skills. They've built companies, run an organization, built an NGO, something like that. And they're interested in solving the biggest problems in the world. Um, the 10 weeks looks like this. For about half the summer, we bring 160 different speakers that deliver about 300 hours of lectures, labs, and workshops on what is the future of all of these fields. Most academics think about the past, right? How did this model evolve? How did this equation develop? And we complement traditional academics and think about where is this going? When we hit the $100 genome, what does that mean? What will that enable? How, what happens at the confluence of these areas? Who are the thought leaders in each of these areas? What are the inflection points in each of these disciplines to watch out for that indicates it's entering that exponential phase? The second half of the summer, as Peter mentioned, we challenge our students to impact, uh, come up with ideas that would impact a billion people uh, within 10 years, and then we launch those at the end of the summer as NGOs or for-profit companies or research ideas. You saw the, um, Daniel showed you the drone idea, moving medicine and food around using drones. This is another one of our companies. Uh, they're growing meat uh, in a lab because it's way, uh, we have, I think, 70 billion farm animals around the world for meat processing. If the middle class grows as expected, we'll need another 50 billion uh, within the next two decades, and the ecology simply will not sustain that. And so uh, uh, growing it in the lab is uh, way better than hacking it out of the side of a cow. Um, uh, our, and of course, it tastes terrible today. Uh, our joke is that the taste is doubling every year. So see how, see how, that, how that works. This is one of the other uh, companies that we've been looking at closely. This is called Contour Crafting. And they're 3D printing houses. And they, the, the machine that they've designed will 3D uh, fabricate a two bedroom house in a day and a half using concrete or adobe or sand if in the Middle East, right? So we look for these uh, very breakthrough ideas. Whether this works or not, you can imagine it'll inspire a whole new way of thinking about that domain, right? And that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, this is a photograph from our curriculum planning meetings, probably the most interesting attribute of our model. Because we're focused on these very fast-moving technologies, it means we have to update our curriculum very frequently. So every time we run a program, we actually convene all of our faculty and we revisit every lecture because we have to, or we're focused on these fast-moving areas. Uh, in what in biotech, we've had what, four major breakthroughs just in the last year, right? So we've had to develop almost a near real-time curriculum development methodology to keep pace with all this change. Uh, you'll hear from Rob, our CEO, in a, in a little while. This, uh, we do an executive program focused on the existing leaders, um, CEOs, investors, uh, and we, that's one week long. Um, if you're running a big company today and you're not aware of what technology is coming along orthogonally to impact you, you're simply not doing your job, right? You end up like Kodak or Nokia or Blackberry. Uh, I went to Waterloo up in Canada, and I've seen the internal emails after the iPhone was announced. Uh, this, the engineers at Blackberry sent us emails to the CEO saying, this is a fraud. It's a fake. You can't have this battery life form factor and screen resolution in one package. Right? First CEOs are totally blindsided when it, uh, when it actually turns out to be real, barely real, uh, if you've seen the recent article in the New York Times. Um, but it taught them the company. Right? And so you cannot afford today to not be aware of where these technologies are going. So for half the week, we do a half a day download across all these disciplines. The second half of the week, we think about um, how will you navigate that in your business, your industry, your product area, and so on. Um, we now have about 2,000 alumni from in 85 countries around the world. And essentially what we're creating is a crucible where we bring together the leading thinkers in the world in the fastest moving technologies and we point them at the biggest problems. Hopefully something happens as we swirl that around. We've now launched about uh, 50 or so startups, each attempting to impact about a billion people. About half of them are still alive, uh, half of those are received funding, and about a handful that we think are on their way to actually achieving that goal. Um, so that's a little bit about Singularity. Uh, you'll be hearing about us nonstop for the rest of the few days. Uh, let me talk about, uh, touch on, this, drill down into this idea of this exponential for a minute. Peter talked about the doubling patterns, and we've kind of 
uh, seen that graph. Um, key question is why does an information-based environment go into this doubling pattern? Right? So the first thing is when you have uh, something like a flashlight or torch, uh, very few people in the world have the expertise to make that. When you essentially dematerialize that to an app on the phone, 10 million developers can hack away the flash on a smartphone, and now you have that many more people working away at it. So the, the democratization is one huge dynamic around this. Um, and Peter mentioned Kodak. This is probably my favorite example to use. Some of you are old enough to remember film photography, right? When you operate from a material basis, uh, every photograph you take costs about a dollar uh, for the film, for the processing, etc. And you're operating from that scarcity environment. You can only t carry so much film around. You frame every shot really carefully uh, because you can, you can only take a few. Uh, the cost is prohibitive and so on. When you go and migrate from that material basis to the information basis and you shift to digital photography, the marginal cost of an extra photograph drops to zero. Right? And now you can take a billion photographs, and we, and we do. Uh, and now you use a different mechanism to manage it. You take uh, 100 times more photographs than you need, uh, and then you desperately try and remember to go back and filter through them, which we never do. Uh, but you can use uh, all these other techniques once you have this in an information basis. So when you go from the material to the uh, information substrate, and you shift that, make that shift, you go from a scarcity model to an abundance model. Right? And once you have it in an information-based environment, you can use modeling, you can copy and move it around, uh, you can apply correlation and machine learning and statistics and modeling and so on, and the democratization continues even faster. And this is essentially what we're seeing across all of these technologies as we move from understanding the genome from a physical environment and to now digitizing the genome, uh, imaging, and so on, especially in the healthcare space, we've seen extraordinary pace of change. And we've seen macro, uh, you know, industry level disruption, but now we're seeing macroeconomic disruptions uh, around this, and I'll talk about that in a second. So Peter showed this slide, this is all very sexy, it's hitting front page news. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Google car? A show of hands, right, most of you, right, great. So uh, you've seen the polite videos of what it's like to drive. I'm gonna, can I get a bit of volume on this? Uh, this is what it's like to ride the Google car. There's a little swearing of this, I apologize, just watch what happens here. There's the polite view of it. Oh, okay. Go right where you're... Holy shit. Sorry, it's on YouTube. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my no. god. What? You, 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 get the, you get the general idea. Um, that screen. That's the visceral scream of humanity meeting advanced technology. Right? That's the amygdala freaking out. Okay? Uh, that's the shift from a linear basis to an exponential basis. When you get in that car for the first time, and it's actually navigating the, the, the obstacle course faster than you could drive it yourself, and there's nobody in the driver's seat, you have that freak out feeling. Right? Your body goes, into, goes nuts. Um, now, after about 10 minutes of driving it, it's like getting into an elevator. Press the button, it takes you where you want to go. But the first reaction is a freakout reaction. What we're seeing around the world today is this, is this freakout reaction to this information-based world that we're entering. Right? This is from a few weeks ago. The Prime Minister of Turkey, a smart, thoughtful, intelligent, experienced guy, making a completely ridiculous comment. Right? That's him getting into the Google car. That's the freak. That's the scream. Okay? Uh, we're now seeing this across the world. We're seeing society respond uh, again in this information-based world in a way we've never seen it. We're not much better here. We're pepper spraying our civics. Uh, we're overreacting massively uh, because we don't know how to navigate all of this information that we're creating. Um, Brad Templeton, one of our faculty, uh, has been showing this photograph for about six years. This is the Constitution with the right to privacy wiped out, the Fourth Amendment. Um, essentially, this has disappeared with no public discourse about it. Right? And the Constitution is the software that runs the country. We have no way of updating it in today's political climate. I'm Canadian, I don't have an expectation of privacy anyway, but if you're a US citizen, that's kind of not a great place to be. It's, the society is pinned by that basic framework, right? And it's now gone. And so this is a, we're now seeing structural issues across all of these areas. This is probably the worst uh, example I've seen of overuse, of, un of misuse of information. This is the Department of Transport in Florida, which has shrunk the duration of yellow lights so that more people get flashed by radar cameras going through red lights through intersections, um, because they can then generate 100 million a year 
extra revenue from this. Okay? The death rate is increasing so that the state can generate extra revenue. Now, if you look back at this from a bit of, bit of clarity, I, we call, I call that treason. This is the state acting demonstrably against the interest of its citizens so it can squeeze a bit of revenue out of it. Right? This is how badly we're able to navigate this information-based world. We don't know how to navigate it. And one of the observations that we've made is all of the structures that we used to run the world today, our politics, our civics, our legal systems, education, healthcare, all designed for a world a few hundred years ago, not for the world of today. Definitely not for where the world is going. And so we're gonna have to rewire and rebuild ourselves from the ground up for all of our societal institutional structures. Uh, these are just some highlights of how this is going. The patent system, fundamentally broken, right? High tech companies now spending more on litigation than on R&D. It's a very bad place to be. Um, and I mentioned our curriculum planning meetings. Even though we have the leading thinkers, thought leaders, researchers in the world coming to speak at SU, we can't become an official accredited state-sanctioned university because to do that, you have to fix your curriculum and not change it. And it brings about the general class of problem that you're facing on a daily basis, which is how does any regulatory framework keep pace as technology is accelerating away from us? By the time the FDA regulates a drug today, the drug is often out of date. Right? And so we're going to have to evolve entirely new methods for how do we do regulatory frameworks going into the future. Uh, actually, in, in higher education, it's even worse. If you're doing a, a master's degree in one of these areas, neuroscience or advanced robotics or biotech, by the time you finish your master's degree, you're out of date. And this is the first time we've ever seen this in the history of the world, that our ability to teach a subject can't move fast enough for the pace of development in that subject area. We've seen it in the web development world over the last, say, uh, five, six years, that web developers have had to update their skills every year or so, but now we're seeing this across all of these areas because we're all being driven by information into this doubling pattern. And uh, uh, Vinod Kosla came and spoke at our closing ceremonies a couple of years ago and gave a fantastic example of how this gap, how wide this gap is. He looked at the exponential growth in mobile phones. We've seen a doubling every two years of mobile phones over the last decade or so, right? And what he did was he went back and looked at 2002, 2004, 6, 8, and asked the question, what did the mobile industry expert analysts say would be the growth of mobile phones at each of those points in time? Who spotted it, who didn't spot it, et cetera? So in 2002, he looked at Gartner, Forrester, Jupiter, McKinsey's, et cetera. Uh, and found that they predicted collectively 16% uh, year-on-year growth was their projection. Two years later, gone up by 100%, so they're off by a little bit. In 2004, the projection was 14%. In 2006, it doubled again, the projection was 12%. And 2008, doubled again, and 2008, unable to handle the fact that you've had this doubling three periods in a row, the world's mobile industry experts said 10%. And then it doubled again. Right? Now, how much more wrong can you be from 10% to 100%? It can't be that much more wrong than that. And you're the mobile phone industry expert. Right? The most extreme example of this is 1984. Uh, McKinsey's did an analysis and advised AT&T that the global market for mobile phones would not exceed 1 million units. And AT&T left the business as a result. Right? And the reason, I, we actually talked to the McKinsey's guy that authored that report. He said, look, we all looked at those big briefcase things and said, no way you're going to sell more than a million of those. And they were right, but they were shrinking in size 50% a year, and that's the part that they missed. Within a few years, we had the start tag, and then all of a sudden, and then the cost drops at the same time. Right? And so, what, uh, not to pick on the mobile phone industry, but Vinod was able to show that this was in oil prices, it was in network bandwidth, it was in a whole host of domains. Where you, wherever you have that exponential curve, the experts in the field will always project linearly. It's too embarrassing to actually make the real prediction. And so this is one of the cognitive gaps that we face as we deal with this world. How do you navigate that back? People come to our executive programs, they spend a week with us. When they go back to their home companies, they sound like raving lunatics, right? Google cars, synthetic biology, neuroscience, da 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 da. And people go, whoa, what the hell have we been smoking? Right? And so this is kind of the issue that we're struggling with and how do we educate around that? And in terms of companies specifically, you know, the metabolism of the economy is accelerating. It used to take about 20 years to create a billion dollar opportunity. We're seeing that now happen in months. Google took eight years, Facebook five years, Groupon. The model may not succeed in the way we thought it would, but they got to a billion dollar revenue run rate in 18 months from a standing start. Right? Maybe the, one of the fastest uh, movements. And you may have seen last week, uh, Grand Theft Auto, a billion dollars of revenues in the first three days. 
a billion dollars in revenues in three days. Right? That's pretty fast. Um, and so as the metabolism accelerates, we're going to have to keep up with that pace of change. Now, one of the things, uh, the other aspect of this, the other side of this is we've noticed is wherever you have an information enabled industry, we see a 10x drop in revenues. We see huge deflationary dynamics because uh, you can go from source to destination with no intermediaries. The newspaper business kind of trundled along, 2007 hit a cliff with Craigslist and eBay, bit 10x drop in revenues in the newspaper business. Music business, the same thing, right? Media companies, the media industry, they're actually trying to sell the media that, that the information is carried on, but really it's an information service. Uh, and iTunes came along and pretty much uh, wiped that out in a different way. So that has happened. We've seen the same thing with renting DVDs versus streaming, uh, Netflix <coughs> versus Blockbuster. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is now starting to hit macroeconomic uh, implications. If you're Uruguay or Argentina, and a big chunk of your economy is coming from beef, you need to be aware that these synthetic beef coming along, and how will you navigate that, right? What will China do as 3D printing gets down to the home environment? And you'll hear a little bit later from Abi about that. Within a decade, the foundation of the Chinese economy could be threatened. If you're India and you're running call centers, uh, all of those will be automated within about three to five years. And so now we're going to see structural macroeconomic implications as being disrupted by this information-based environment. Now, uh, it's something I've been looking at very carefully over the last uh, few months with uh, uh, the Singularity faculty and with Peter and so on, is the rise of this new breed of organizational structure. And we call it an exponential organization. Uh, we're seeing a new breed. I'll give you some examples here. Um, uh, how many of you are familiar with Quirky? Show of hands. So Quirky is a consumer packaged goods company. Um, back scratchers and power adapter strips and whatnot. Uh, a normal CPG company like Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson takes somewhere between 250 to 300 days to go from idea to uh, design to manufacturing to having the product being sold in Walmart or Bed Bath & Beyond. Quirky does that same cycle in 29 days. Okay. Uh, local Motors uh, creates a, a, a Ford or, or car company that costs you about $3 billion to create a new car model. Local Motors crowdsources all of the elements of the design. They do it for about $3 million. Okay. Uh, Chris Anderson, who's the head of Wired Magazine, is running a whole DIY drones uh, project uh, with a community development of uh, drones. Um, the $300,000 Predator drone that the US military uses, their community does 90, their drone does 98% of the functionality of the Predator drone for $300. Forget $300,000. And so something that we've noticed across all of these companies, we've identified maybe 35 or 40 of these, these new, it's a new organizational form, is that we're seeing a minimum of 10x improvement in base metrics of that, of that industry, right? So let me give you a couple of characteristics. TED is an example. It was a kind of a successful conference, but fairly static. Chris Anderson takes it over, releases the TED Talks for free, uh, uses the community to essentially evangelize on the behalf of launches TEDx events. Uh, and now we have, um, uh, now it's a global media brand within three years, right? Unheard of in the media business that you can create a global brand that quickly. And this is an interesting point. This is that difference between, you know, think about all of our strategic planning operates on this linear basis. You look at how you did over the last few years and then you project out linearly from there, right? So uh, the TEDx example is a great one. If Chris had stood up uh, on day one, when they launched these TEDx events and said, look, we're gonna have 8,000 of these within five years, he would have completely lost the team, right? They said, you're totally crazy. There's no way we can do that, okay? uh, What they did was they said, look, here are the rules on how we're gonna do this. We'll let the community do it. Uh, John Hagel and uh, John C. Lee Brown at Deloitte called this the power of pull. Um, let the community pull these things out from you, give them, give them certain guidelines. Uh, they let that happen with no constraints aside from the, the rules on how you run it. Um, uh, and they are actually on track to do 8,000 events within five years. Right? Now, if you've done this using a corporate planning department, they would have said, let's do 20 in Q1 and maybe 25 in Q2. And once we learn a bit, we'll do 40 in Q3. And if you project that out, you may have done maybe a couple of thousand, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, over a five year period. And that would be a hell of a stretch, right? You'd have a tough time selling that to the CEO if you can do just thousands of events within a couple of years. And they're on track to do 8,000. On, this, on that same basis. 
And so there's this fascinating use. And what we're seeing with these org organizations is our traditional way of building a business has been to gather an asset, uh, get expertise, uh, uh, put your organizational uh, legal entity surrounding that asset, whether it's uh, intellectual property, whether it's uh, people, expertise, equipment, and so on, gather a workforce, and essentially sell access to that workforce. What we're seeing with this new breed of organization, as, as some of the mechanisms that uh, Peter mentioned, we're essentially turning that inside out and tapping into what's going around us, and essentially being the conduit uh, between these. Um, donors Choose is one example. They've gone from now five million to I think 200 million in donations without adding a single person internally because their internal systems are so scalable. Um, XPRIZE is a great example. Five billion media impressions per prize that, that Peter runs. Uh, SU, we ran our first year with 160 speakers. Uh, all of this uh, 300 hours of lectures, labs, and workshops, and our core team was like five people in our first year. And when you and I would maintain that if you've gone three, four years before that, that wouldn't have been possible. Without the use of like Google Docs and file sharing and activity streams and everybody communicating in real time, uh, you would not have been able to do that. And so here are the, some of the attributes that we've seen of this new animal, this uh, very collaborative, high use of collaborative technologies to share information uh, with the thing. Small, multi-skilled uh, teams operating very autonomously. We found organizations that have no management structure, no reporting lines, no job descriptions. Okay, the best example of this is called Valve Software up in Seattle. Uh, they're a gaming software company. They hire people that are self-starters and essentially say, pick whichever project you like and go work on that project. And they have no internal management structure at all. Uh, and Valve does about three billion a year in sales. They get more em uh, revenue per employee than Microsoft. And they were able to do this with, uh, I think, 400 employees. And you think, okay, that works for quirky, creative companies in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, lunatic types, uh, hippies, and so on. But that wouldn't work for a, a big uh, company that has regulatory requirements and so on. We found ING Direct, which is a big bank in Canada, um, operates on this basis. A bank operates with no reporting lines, no job descriptions, and so on. Uh, and a normal bank in town that has about 10,000 in deposits per employee, ING operates at 40,000 deposits per employee. And so they've shown this new mechanism of having small teams that swarm around uh, uh, working on projects that are most urgent, most needed, etc. Leveraging the capability of instant communication across the organization is able to achieve this kind of minimum 10x performance level. Uh, very scalable processes, very distributed authority, um, Radical re-engineering of how we do traditional functions and heavy leveraging of the community and the crowd, gamification, incentive prizes, and so on. And so, uh, fascinating as we finish this, uh, as we work on this research. Uh, Kaggle, you'll hear from Jeremy Howard uh, tomorrow, but they, Kaggle has a, a social network of, of about 100,000 data scientists. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Kaggle? Right. So, uh, they have this grow, big community of data scientists. It's really hard to hire a data scientist. They're not very employable, they have weird habits and weird times, and they think about things in a very bizarre way. Um, uh, you know, uh, Allstate has maybe 50 of the best data scientists and actuaries in the world. They put their uh, algorithm up against the Kaggle social network as a contest. Um, within three days, the crowd of data scientists have beaten Allstate's best algorithm that they've been working on for decades, their claims algorithm by the end of the 10 week process had beaten it by 300, improved it by 340%. Okay? And this is the most evolved and sophisticated claims algorithm in the world. By applying the intelligence of the crowd to it, was able to do it. And what, what Kaggle found, and Jeremy is now working on a new model uh, using the same social network. What Kaggle found is every one of the 350 kind of contests that they run with their clients, uh, they're in their community of data scientists have beaten the existing system 100% of the time. And they charge like five or $10,000 to run a contest. And he's actually spinning out a whole new company to try and do this uh, in a new way. So we're seeing these really fascinating model, Uber or Airbnb, you may be familiar with. Those are examples uh, where uh, Uber or Airbnb, for their, their cost of adding another room to rent, their marginal cost of supply is zero. They essentially can scale supply with no cost, right? 
And what we found on the internet is, is cost of demand is actually dropped to zero because you have the internet and viral frameworks and internet marketing and so on. And when you have the cost of uh, supply dropping to zero and the cost of demand dropping to zero, you have a really scalable business. Um, the, uh, the best example we have around this is Waze. How many of you are familiar with Waze? Right? It uses your GPS on your cell phone to uh, see how bad the traffic is if 10 Waze users suddenly slow down on, on 405 here, um, they kind of can see that in real time. Um, in 2007, when Jobs announced the iPhone, two months later, Nokia spent $8 billion buying Navtech. Navtech all, owns all the road sensors in all the highways, mostly around the world, and has proprietary access to all of the sensors. And Nokia figures, let's buy that asset, and then we have the lock on all traffic information. At the same time that that purchase happened, Waze launches and piggybacks on the GPS of its cell phones of its users uh, to scale. Nobody notices it; it's growing exponentially. Uh, now Waze has 15 million users, and they're scaling more data points effortlessly. Um, Navtech has maybe uh, 500,000 data points and can't scale, can't improve linearly to replace that infrastructure is almost impossible. Um, Nokia just got sold for $7 billion, less than what they bought in Navtech for five years ago. Uh, Waze just got sold for a billion dollars to Google, has 50 million users, has less than 100 employees. Uh, and this is the new model that we're seeing. Tap into the resource or access around you, and you can scale your organization unbelievably quickly. Right? Airbnb uh, hotel rooms is now valued at about half of Hyatt hotels worldwide. Hyatt has 45,000 employees worldwide. Airbnb is about 160. If you need to make a sudden shift in the marketplace, who's going to be faster at shifting in that marketplace? And so we're now seeing these kind of what we call EXOs or exponential organizations pop up in almost every industry. We were working with Deloitte to see how many there were in the CPG industry, consumer packaged goods industry. And in that retail world, in the 90s and say the early 2000s, there were maybe five major breakthroughs in that industry. Uh, point of sale transactions and loyalty cars and RFID tags for supply chain and so on. Um, we identified, uh, Deloitte identified 200 disruptive startups operating in that space in the last year. And when they kind of separated the wheat from the chaff to see which were the really truly disruptive ones, they found 80. 80 truly disruptive startups in the CPG space where we've had kind of five disruptions over the last 15 years. Now we have 80 happening at the same time, right? And when you looked into it, when uh, the partner there, Marcus Shingles, looked into it, he found that uh, the big CPG companies, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, etc., the smart ones had partnerships with all of those, uh, a lot of those 80 companies. And the rest of the CPG didn't even know they existed. Right? So keeping an eye out for what's happening around you is a very critical one. Um, let me end on this note, because the, the, this is the last part of it, I think, that becomes really important. You can do with a small team today something that big companies and big governments could only do five years ago or seven years ago or 10 years ago, right? The power of information is down, down to that individual level or the small, and of course, a small team can take much bigger risks than a large team. This is Emiliano Cardiman, um, one of our alumni. He's actually voted uh, by our faculty, the one person most likely to actually impact a billion people. What he's done, he's launched nanosatellites up into orbit. Um, and when he has a cluster of them, he will be able to provide real-time video and images anywhere in the world to a one meter resolution. Right? Real-time video anywhere in the world to a one meter resolution. Right? Parking spots in New York, crop management, asset security. I'm sure the NSA is looking very carefully at this. Um, his first two satellites have already launched. And so he's launching an app store model so that anybody can launch apps on that. So if I want to track my fleet of cars or trucks, if I want to count the number of uh, cars in a Walmart parking lot anywhere in the world, I can do it like that. And so this is going to be pretty disruptive. Um, the other example that we'd like to use is, is um, you've all seen these $100 headsets and you'll be hearing more about these uh, different brainwave frequencies. If I want to focus on work, work on a spreadsheet, read some research, etc., I want alpha waves in my head. Those the, that's the focused uh, brainwave that I can do. This is on the right, one of our alumni, Will Henschel, uh, he was a guitarist for the Eurythmics, the band from the 1980s. He's actually composing music that when you play the music, puts your brain into a focused alpha state. Okay? So this is me on the left in the silhouette uh, wearing a headset. That's my brain. And this is me before and after he starts playing the music. 
and you can see my brain is flooded with alpha waves, right? And now I'm in the zone. I can crank out emails, spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Elon Musk, all of his engineers have used this eight hours a day. They say they can't live without it. Um, and he's doing this. Think about how disruptive this idea is. If you're Red Bull, you need to be a little worried about this, right? Or if you're a coffee industry, you need to be worried about this. Um, he's doing this with a Mac and a $100 headset. This level of disruption. And now we have, as Peter mentioned, and as Daniel mentioned, $35 tablets available, and 5 billion people will all be online in the next few years. So this is how quickly it's going to happen, and we're going to have to navigate this. Uh, so I have about a minute for questions. If there's any questions, we'll take a minute. But I'll be here today and tomorrow if anybody wants to grab me. Uh, but thank you very much for your time.